Hello and good evening. My name is Carl Singleton and we thank you for joining us today for a seat at the table, humbly hosted by yours truly. Our podcast is designed to serve as a conduit that directly engages predominantly black communities with decision makers and those with connections to them, ultimately ensuring communities needs are met by accessing available resources. Uh, We are thrilled today uh, on this Black History, this first day of Black History Month in our celebration uh, to have the chairwoman of the Pennsylvania Utilities Commission, um, Chairwoman Gladys Brown Detrell joining us today so that we can engage in a conversation around something that oftentimes, as we say, we, we don't really think about, but we utilize every day with regards to utilities. Um, Without any further ado, um, because I want to make sure that we get um, Ms. Brown the trail in and out um, so we can have your questions um, brought forth and we have that balance here today. Um, so Ms. Brown the trail, what I would like you to do, if you would, please just start off with, you know, where you're from, your familiarity with the area, uh, how you aspired to get to this position. Um, things that you've done in the past and the importance of not only what the PUC actually does, but the things that you have been able to uh, to leverage in your position with, with your colleagues that ultimately provides a desirable service for the constituents throughout the Commonwealth. So without any further ado, Mrs. Gladys Brown Detrell, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Carl. And thank you for the invitation to join you tonight on your podcast. I'm very excited about it. Um, you asked me a whole host of questions right there in that statement. So where do I start from first, except for to say that I am uh, homegrown from the area, born and raised in Middletown, Pennsylvania, uh, just down the road. So uh, it, it has been interesting to see my professional career develop here in this area. You know, many times when we go away to school, we don't necessarily come back home, but uh, I was privileged to come back home and start my career here and have continued it. Um, I went to the University of Pittsburgh for both undergrad and law school. And with that, during my summer times, I would come back home and work. Uh, in law school, I actually worked for not only a private firm here in Harrisburg after my first year of law school, which was called Glenn and Kearns, but then served in, at the um, Department of Labor and Industry and their Bureau of Workers' Compensation in my second summer in law school. And that got me very interested in state government. And after I graduated from law school, came home and worked for the Department of State originally. Uh, Clerked also for a federal judge back out in Pittsburgh, but then ultimately came back and stayed when I went to work in 1991 with the Senate of Pennsylvania's Democratic Caucus starting there as an assistant counsel in 91 and then promoted up uh, in 1994 to deputy chief counsel where I stayed there for the rest of my career or time there with the Senate until I was appointed to the position of commissioner by then Governor Tom Corbett. And that was in 2013. And then I was very fortunate and honored to serve as chair, be appointed as chair by Uh, current governor Tom Wolf in 2015 and then was reappointed to that position in 2019 as chair. So So, um, 
Oh. I was going to say, you asked me a lot of questions. You I know, might no, have to repeat no, a couple of things. <laughs> no, no, you're, hey, listen, that's, that's the lawyer and you you went bang, 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 bang right down the line. So let me ask, let me just ask before we get into your, your current role. Uh, could you talk about the, the, the climate um, that you, that you had to navigate um, being a, a black woman in particular? Um, I, I, we hear a lot about the Senate um, on the national level, but our, all politics are local and our Senate, uh, here it yields a lot of power with regards to things that impact our daily life, um, as well as our House representatives. So being in that role with the Senate regarding that um, the, the the legal piece uh, with, with the Senate Democratic Committee, could you talk a little bit about your experiences there and some things that you are most proud of or were involved with there that directly impacted all communities, but in particular those, since we're in Black History Month, we're going to talk about those communities um, that that um, oftentimes are underserved and underrepresented? Well, first of all, let me say that it, in terms of getting into the Senate, it was very interesting. I remember coming back after clerking for a, a Black federal judge out in Pittsburgh looking for a position, and I tapped into contacts that I had that both were registered Democrats and registered Republicans. It was also at the time that Governor Casey had just won a second term, but also put a hiring freeze in place in the state. And so they weren't hiring anyone. And one of my friends who worked for the Senate Republicans said, I believe that the Senate Democrats are looking for attorneys. And so I was able to send my resume, had some other people vouch for me. And when I went in for the interview, the minority leader at that time was Bob Mello. And he said, you've got Republicans and Democrats calling here about you. So I, I was very fortunate in that sense. And I guess it showed them how I can reach across the aisles because I was a registered Democrat and have, have been a lifelong Democrat. But with that, it also helped me in terms of building those relationships um, that you needed to get things done. And my time there was very fortunate in the sense that we were able to do a lot of things um, maybe in terms of our caucus, we weren't able to get everything that we wanted, um, but it definitely uh, it opened my eyes and gave me a lot more opportunities to do even areas of the law that I didn't expect to do. Um, one of the things that I, I joke to people about is I never wanted to do utility law. And I was given that one of those areas to cover because of the fact that I worked for the Department of State I worked in their Bureau of Professional and Occupational Affairs. The committee in the Senate that handles utility issues also does professional licensure. So they said, you, you know, you handle that, commi that committee in terms of the legal issues that may come up to the Democratic leader's office because you at least know that part of it. And you can learn the other part of the utility law. It was during that time that things really started moving in the utility sector including in, uh, changes in telecommunication law, changes in uh, electric competition that um, allowed for the competitive market to start back in 96, then also in the natural gas uh, industry, all those different types of things. And it got to the point where when I wanted to give it away because we started hiring more attorneys, they were like, no one wants to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you have it. Mm -hmm. But here I stand today serving on the commission in an area of law that I never wanted to do. Um, but, it, but being in the Senate, it was challenging um, in the sense of most of the time, when I first came on, there was a, a African-American deputy chief counsel. Um, so there was only five of us that were in the central legal staff. Um, Larry left uh, to go on to another uh, career change. And then I was there and was able to move up into his position, very fortunate with that, and was able to help many young attorneys, African-American attorneys that have been looking in positions to come into the Senate to work for other senators, um, which, you know, I, I was very happy with that. Uh, you know, being able to open up people's eyes to the legislative process is, is not something that I even thought about when I was growing up, but it's exciting and it shows also the opportunities that are there to be able to help um, people within our communities 
just to navigate that area. And, you know, some of the things that I saw done in the Senate, I was like, I never thought about that. I never thought, you know, that was even possible. But uh, and some of them are still there today. And so I'm very happy about that and those opportunities and just the legislation that we were able to work on and pass that helped members of our community. Um, you know, what were some think of, what about were, it before. What, what were some of the areas? Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, so there are people that honestly, you know, and we talked before, there's people that, you know, are watching you now. They, they've seen your face. They've probably seen you in passing, but probably have no idea what you do. Um, and even when, you know, we announced that you're going to be on here, a lot of people, you know, was inboxing me like, yeah, that's my aunt. And yeah, that's this and that. But they're, they're, they're friends of I friends. I paid them to do that, just so you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I paid them to do it, actually. You know, just, <laughs> no, no. But I, like I said, I'm just. You know, that shows how broad, you know, your family is, not only your professional family and the contacts you make, but your blood relatives. And, and it's great. So we have a lot of commonalities there. But when you have um, the ability, one thing that I always say about you and, um, you know, even when I was on my journey and that I remain on and I wasn't always as polished as I should be, you know, there were people like you that never, you know, turned on a younger guy. Uh, that was trying to find his way and offer some real stern at times construction criticism and feedback, but it was for the betterment of the masses, you know, and so I always value that. And I, I, I look at, you know, where you are now and I kind of drifted away from, you know, if you can talk a bit about uh, what it means to use it, be a, a role model for those of us that see you, even though we don't know what you do, but we know you do something. And then when we find out what it is that you do, that I think further speaks to your level of professionalism, character, and integrity, because you're fighting a fight um, for people in communities that oftentimes don't understand the need. But if that, if you weren't doing what you were doing, there would be a void, and they would be screaming and shouting, "What are you doing?" You know, one of those right. that makes sense. It, it does. So um, I, I was very fortunate. So you talk about me maybe uh, uh, pulling your coattails a little bit. Um, I was very fortunate to have people do that for me. My first couple of jobs out of law school were my first one with the Department of State was uh, my boss was a black female. And the second one after her was also a black female. And then I worked for a black a male judge. I, I just had a lot of opportunities and people that, you know, said to me, you, you shouldn't do this or it's great that you're doing this and maybe you want to do it in this way or that way. And I remember that going into the Senate and working in the General Assembly, because not only, of course, we worked with members of the House as well, but just the younger ones saying, look, they don't write this stuff down for you in terms of the legislative process, things you need to know, how you need to maybe address certain things. These are the things that I wanted to always pass on to other people. I've always mentioned, even in talking to other women, saying that, um, as a black woman, our path is not necessarily a straight line from point A to point B. It's the goal that you need to focus on. And sometimes you're diverted in other directions. But if you stay focused on that goal, um, you're going to get there, hopefully. Uh, but don't get discouraged, uh, even when you get you know, pulled back a little bit or uh, turned into different directions. Just stay focused on your goal. So I remember that, that the path is never a straight line. Yeah. And you, uh, and I can, I can vouch for that. Um, there's, you know, I'm reminded of, um, and I'll, I'll mention, I can remember, you know, when I was getting involved politically, I would go to various meetings and, you know, our presence preceded itself. And then, you know, I'll never forget Mr. Nate Waters senior. Um, he was a solicitor at, at the school district. Mm -hmm. um, and, I was making one of my rant, one of my one of my statements to Gerald Cohn at the time, and um, after the meeting, he pulled me to the side and he said, "Look," he said, "You're right." He said, "But you yelling and fussing, nobody's gonna be listening to you." He's like, "And I'm not marching anymore. I did that. I'm not holding signs. I did that." You know, he's like, "Remember this: you don't always have to kill an ant with a sledgehammer." And I was just like, it went over my head, you know, because I was you know ticked at the time, but. I'm, I'm talking about it now, you know, at 48. And that was back, you know, I think 29, 30 years old, you know, and so you, you're right. Once you just drop those little jewels in on people, 
Uh, you never know. And um, I'm oftentimes reminded of saying to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, yeah. So, so that is definitely, you know, a mod, mantra that we live by. So let's talk a little bit about um, some things or, or challenges you may have faced in your, in your current role or things that you, yeah, we'll start off with some challenges. And I usually call those grows and glows. So some of your grows, we'll say, not only challenges, we'll call them growing opportunities or grows. Are there certain things that, you know, you've run up against or thought were going to be one way, finding out that there's something is complete opposite? And how do you re react to that adversity in your current position? I know you've had it before, but right. in this right. current position. What I say many times is my current position, my previous position prepared me for my current position. Um, and, and some of the advice that I've gotten from former commissioners is that not everyone likes you, meaning not me specifically, but just, you know, it, people may be nice to you, but it, they may not really like you as long if you're going against something that they want. Uh, and I learned that well over in the Senate that it, it, people definitely have their own focus or idea of something. And if you're going to go against it, they may not be very happy with you at all. But I also learned from my experience at the Senate and working in the General Assembly is to, to not take it personally and, and uh, don't let it distract you from what you think is right and what you're trying to do. So you can definitely work on some compromise. So with that, my, my biggest challenge was the first thing that I didn't expect to be the chair of the commission. I had come over there in 2013, in October of 2013, and by May of 2015, I was the chair and I, I chuckled about it. And I thought, having worked in politics all this time, I know all the challenges of being a chair, of not necessarily being it myself, but I've seen it and some of the challenges and everything else. And everyone, um, it, it can be difficult at times. So that was my first challenge of saying, OK, you are the chair. You have to deal with this. There's many. Uh, administrative issues that you have to deal with and still trying to learn just the process of being the commissioner. It's not as easy as people may think. They say you're just making decisions on cases. Well, these cases are voluminous and they have a lot of different challenges and legal parts to it. And there's more areas of the utility law that we cover that most people don't realize. So that's the biggest hurdle, being able to juggle all of that together. And then also, it's just a different personality. I learned that well in the Senate. And I, you, you, we know it here. When you're working with a group of people that are very, this is my, my phrase to my fellow commissioners is that we're all very passionate about what we do. And with that, <laughs> we have a we're passionate about what we do. It may come out in a different way, but ultimately I think we're also, um, we wanna do what's best for the consumers. We just may have a different idea of what is best. So we have to work, work down, you know, knock down those barriers between us and our difference of opinion and try to work together on, on some compromises. As, and I also say, it's not about me. I don't need to take the lead yeah. just because I'm the chair. Right. Or something. If ultimately I get what I think is best, it doesn't have to be in my name. So, you know, so you, I, I learned that well in the Senate. So you, you touched on something right there where, um, that I want to hone in on. In your role with the Utility Commission, our, our, though our viewers need to understand clearly that you are advocates for the consumer. And I think that is key in terms of balance, in terms of uh, regulation. And so if you can talk a little bit more, um, not saying so our, you consumers, right. but our, our right. mission is to balance the needs of the utilities with that of the consumer. So it's to find that balance, right. um, because it was what most people don't realize is that even though it's called the Public Utility Commission, most of the entities that we regulate, the utilities that deliver service to their homes are private owned, private invested entities. Most of the public utilities, such as in the city of Harrisburg, where you have capital region water, or in a municipality such as Middletown, where they own their own electric, that's owned by the actual municipality, and we don't regulate them. There's only two exceptions with the PUC where we regulate or have oversight over municipal-owned entities, and that's the Philadelphia Gas Works and the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer. So, so with that, people just need to, to recognize that 
<laughs> they are private entities that um, you know are providing that service, are in, entitled to be paid for their service, but we are there to provide that protection for consumers to make sure that they get adequate, safe, reliable, and affordable service is what our role is. Safe, reliable, and affordable. Okay. Correct. All right. No, I respect that. And we know, we know how that goes. So one of our questions um, that, you know, I had gotten was relative to Comcast. And we had a little pre-discussion, you know, on that because um, one of the constituents in the community mentioned about broadband and uh, Comcast and the, the current things that are going on with regards to students being at home and, you know, equitable access and so forth and so on. And, um, price gouging possibly. And um, so that was something that I wanted to bring up so that you can clearly identify um, what's under your purview and umbrella of the PUC and what is not. And I, I do appreciate the question because uh, it, it this pandemic has brought out many things and also the importance of broadband and the need for it, uh, for it to be not only affordable, but to be able to have access to it. One of the things that we learned quickly um, in the pandemic that persons in the rural areas may not necessarily have the access because of where they're located. And then also the build out to the rural areas in Pennsylvania is difficult as well. But then also when you're talking about access because of affordability, that also is a problem for some households in terms of being able to just to have that need for students that are at home and are taking their classes remotely, if they can't afford to have the access to broadband, they can't do their classes, they can't attend remotely. So those are issues that we discuss all the time, but it's also part of my, my phrase that I always say that we discuss more things that we don't regulate. That's where I'm getting to. We actually don't regulate broadband. We regulate it only to a certain degree, and that degree has been met. The last statute, it's under chapter 30 in our in our statute, we talked about the build out of broadband and we, companies had to the year 2015 to build out broadband in their area to the speed, of, it's called the um, DSL or I call it the dial up speed. And we have surpassed that greatly we're now up to what they refer to as the netflix speed you know you're watching <laughs> videos and everything else so we no longer have jurisdiction we don't have jurisdiction of the netflix speed that everyone needs to handle everything doing all these video calls and everything else that is controlled by the fcc but our state still our commission still has information that we pass on we always serve as a resource most recently, there were auctions of federal funding that went to companies that applied for those funds to help them with the build out for rural Pennsylvania or rural areas within, within the, the country. We were very fortunate as a commission, our staff worked hard in just educating companies saying, you can apply for these things. This is what you need to do. These are the deadlines all that type of information. And we, our company was about 13 different rural, which is small companies that were able to receive so many millions of dollars in grants, federal funding to help build out in these rural areas that would have allow people to have more access. Um, and, and this has just been a very, it's very beneficial to us as a commission knowing that even though we don't regulate broadband, we still can provide information, resources that we have accumulated over the years. So uh, I can't answer, I can't help out with whatever Comcast is doing in terms of their rates because we don't regulate that. So let me, so Jennifer Smallwood has a question. Uh, she asks, does the PUC, uh, the utilities under you, oversee any programming provided for the underserved? Are there any board mandates for such? Um, programs, and I, I'm going to try to assume what she's asking in terms of programs mandated. Um, or maybe there's different, there's different programs in terms of customer assistance programs that will provide for um, assistance. So generally our statute, when you're talking about customer assistance, 
uh, provides that companies shall provide for some type of customer assistance. It doesn't delineate exactly what it is, but they have okay. to file things before us. And the reason for it is because of the uniqueness in each of the distribution areas. As I stated, we have a, a bigger state and we have the urban areas, the suburban areas. So each distribution area may need something different. And you see in, in the larger metropolitan areas, they do provide for more types of customer assistance programs, things that people can have access to. Um, so the mandate is that they provide for some type of program. What we don't do is to say, you need to do, or to say, this is how you need to do it. But when they do come in and, and file their plans, they do have to be approved by us. And at that point we can say, well, we've noticed that this has been happening in your, your area. Maybe you need to do this, or maybe you need to do that. So when you're talking about mandates in that way, yes, but also still the mandate in terms of the general safe, reliable and affordable service. That, that's a mandate that's in our statute and required. And then also when we're talking about different things in terms of reliability, those companies also have a federal mandates that come down that we as a state have to follow. You know, talking about gas safety and things of that nature, that has been um, an issue for our state. We are one of the older states that have, you know, in, in terms of the infrastructure in the ground, it's aging infrastructure. The General Assembly has addressed that in a couple different ways, uh, starting out in 1996 with some type of, it's called a distribution system, in, system improvement charge or, or a diff that allowed for the water companies to really accelerate the, the build out or changing their old infrastructure into new because it, the quality of service just wasn't there or, or really needed to be improved. And then when you started seeing with the aging gas infrastructure too, some explosions, and one in Philadelphia, one in Allentown, you know, the need for safety was very important there. So the General Assembly did the same thing in allow, allowing for that type of charge to be added monthly to an individual's bill. That, but it was so small in nature, but big in terms of what it would do. That also helps out when you have storm damage or storm repair that needs to be done. You know, people were in the middle of a snowstorm now. They want to make sure their electricity is on. We don't want to be in the middle of this broadcast and all of a sudden our electricity goes down. Well, we have <laughs> Comcast, so we'll just have a backup on the. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not touching that. I know. I'm just. <laughs> Let me, uh, so um, here's a question from Jess Hoffman. Uh, wants me to ask about things PUC has regulated for the state, which I think you touched on a bit, has regulated for the state regarding utilities. How is that helping folks? And I think if you want to elaborate more on um, underserved communities and the things that you, you regulate, or not you personally, but the commission regulates and how that is mutually beneficial for not only our uh, underserved communities, but also for business as well. Well, what I can tell you that, especially during this pandemic, uh, some of the things that we have talked about and put in place also with, uh, we originally started out at the beginning of this pandemic by putting a moratorium in place where no one would have their service cut off because of the fact that people needed to be staying at home, socially distancing, and, and it was important in terms of the health and safety of, of the consumers within the state to allow them to continue to have service to their home water being a very important one, as well as electricity and everything else. We then revised that after getting more data in and issued an order back in October that still put protections in place for especially households that are at an income of 300% or lower. And the emphasis on that is because most of the time, any consumer protection programs that we have in place is an income level of 150% or lower of the federal poverty income guideline. And if you're about to ask me what that amount is, <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. So, um, but it's it, okay, it you got a lot to remember. So. It, it doubled the amount that we normally see because of the data that we were getting in with this pandemic from the company saying we, we have people that are having some problems of paying their bills and they're above the normal income level that we were seeing any other time. So, those are protections that we did put in place that moratorium or those protections are ending at the end of what we call the winter moratorium season, which is March 31st of this year. 
that's important to know. March 31st, those protections in. Take yeah. note of that. That might uh, put that in the comments as one of our notes, uh, Chad or Conrad, please. So, so protections end for the 300% or below. Now, remember, we always have some type of customer assistance program in place. Right. And also, you know, payment arrangements and things of that nature. Okay. Um, what I like to do is uh, talk about after the commercial break, um, our fin the, the final, the policy statement, you know, talking about equity and inclusion and what we want to do, uh, especially, you know, with the work that I do in the community and throughout the state regarding the Pennsylvania Diversity Coalition uh, for equitable, equitable inclusion uh, for minority women owned and controlled businesses. We want to touch on that. But first, we're going to take a little break. Let, uh, let you get a swig of water or something and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. You're watching. Hello, this is Juanita Edrington Grant coming to you from the Harrisburg Uptown Building, 1821 Fulton Street, the former Hamilton Health Center building. We are classified as the hub in Harrisburg, PA. You will now see a brief video of what we have named the Castile Edrington Community Room. It's on the second floor, fifth street entrance of our building at 1821 Fulton Street. We're providing this video to you so that you can get a brief glimpse of our newest addition to our building, which is a room that we are allowing to be used for several different occasions, uh, be it uh, educational seminars, conferences, family dinners. Um, we do have a capacity of holding at least 100 people, which is 10 tables, 100 chairs, or a professional corporate setup. And we're looking to um, paste this information on the Hub website within the next couple of weeks so that you can see uh, more of the advertisement, a price list, and the different um, information that you may want to know about renting this space. This space was designed uh, by TLC Workbase Training and TLC Renovation, Renovation and Construction. Owner and CEO is Tori Castile. Yes, another one of the great projects created by Tori Castile. If you want to get in touch with us, please feel free to call me at 717-889-6377. Look forward to speaking to you from the hub. All right. Thank you very much for staying with us, uh, guests, um, our uh, audience. I should I should say not only guests, but uh, one of the things that we that we like to talk about next is um, the utility commission's uh, stance with regards to diversity and inclusion. Uh, I know there's been some great work, um, some heavy lifting that's been going on. Uh, there's been some public, you know, statements. Uh, I'm sorry, public comment period, a public comment period. And so we're in the next stages of uh, seeing this policy statement come to fruition and become a reality. Um, if nothing else, you ought to be commended, which I, I, I have before and I'll continue to do for pushing this needle forward. Um, it's been started and stopped, I'm sure, various times, but um, you're here, you're in the seat. So you're going to be the chairwoman who um, is hopefully credited you know, with moving this needle forward to, to the degree that is fully inclusive and doing um, some great things. So if you'd like to talk about it, talk about the um, way it's been progressing, and here we are. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about our diversity and inclusion uh, policy statement and, and also our regulations. Just to give you a little bit of background, and so I can't take all the credit. Uh, the actual, the PUC started on a policy statement that was enacted back in 1995. So that was over 25 years ago. And, and But, you know, during that time, that was groundbreaking to be able to put into place a policy statement that talked about hiring, compensation, uh, training, and, and advancing individuals based upon merit, uh, regardless of their uh, diversity, identities, and, and promoting some type of affirmative action steps that eliminates barriers for protected groups. 
So that was very important to have that conversation back in 1995. And, and the purpose of the, the statement was to provide for reporting to the commission. I, I looked at it, you know, it was 25 years ago and I thought, along with some of the discussions we have been having at the commission and we recreate, we created what we call our utilities career campaign back in 2017. And we started also looking at the fact that we needed to really revamp the policy statement to first of all, make some additions to it, but to reinvigorate that effort to talk to our larger utilities about diversity and inclusion, what they're doing, how they're reporting some things to us, because we had the reports, but sometimes they weren't reporting them in a more stream standard way. We had sometimes too much information, sometimes too little information, and then sometimes information that really wasn't usable in terms of what we were trying to encourage our larger companies to do. And that was the reason for looking at making some changes to our policy and then moving into um, what we call our regulated process. Right, and I think is, is, is um, you know, people talk about the process and it's important to highlight, you know, that this is a process, this is strongly encouraged, but there's really not enforcement. Uh, so if you wanna, you know, talk a little bit about the, the difference between regulating and strongly encouraging uh, versus and or um, enforcement, we'll just say. Right. Well, first, let me talk the difference between a policy statement and regulations, because currently what's in place is a, is a policy statement that we revised actually in, in uh, February of last year. We revised it and approved a, a policy statement, but also stated that we wanted to move it towards regulation. So it would go through a regulatory review process that includes going through the General Assembly and then to the Independent Regulatory Review Commission for final approval. And that could take like two years. And, and what, why I wanted to push that is most people don't realize that a policy statement is not enforceable. So it's the regulations that need to go through that entire process, go through the General Assembly, go through the Independent Regulatory Review Commission where they have comments from people and finalize it in a form that's on the books in terms for everyone to see. And then that is enforceable by the commission. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to highlight that because I don't want uh, us to have this conversation about this policy statement and people come back it's like, hey, Carl, you and Gladys were on there, y'all were talking about this, that, and the other, and what about this? And what Well, now this is where understanding, you know, state government, this is where our state reps and our state senators come in at, you know, and this is where, you know, for us, and you're not saying this, this is me, you know, at this point, this is where in particular for Harrisburg, you know, Patty Kim and uh, the Senator DeSantis come, comes in. And so we need to make sure that we understand that the train is on the track. However, when we want to see some, some real um, tangible outcomes um, uh, that are benefiting our communities, this is only the beginning. There's another piece that needs to be had to be completed, which is the regulatory process, which is, you know, laying over in, in, in the state house in the Senate. We'll say. So um, I just wanted to make sure that was clear for everyone. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, I was going to say go to the phones, but since we're remote, we're not doing the phone piece. Uh, we are still in our comment section um, uh, taking questions. Let me let me ask. Um, if there were young attorney, aspiring attorneys now um, that, that cross paths with you, what would be your selling points in terms of getting involved with the utility side of things? Um, uh, I, I know oftentimes there are young attorneys that we meet that goes, you know, to the DA or the prosecutor or defense attorneys, you know, or even, you know, contract law or, you know, whatever it is, but I'm sure there is, um, th there is there are career pathways that um, we haven't considered that pay very well, um, make for great retirements. And we were on a, a call with the, a gentleman who was familiar with some contracting opportunities in the natural gas and, and other entities uh, that the PUC may um, be in contact, you know, have dealings with. And his response was, we've got to get involved. You got to see what's going on. There's things that 
are here that our communities can benefit from. So are there, what, how would you encourage, uh, well, why would you encourage those lawyers to come to the utility side? Well, not just lawyers, but like I said before, uh, back in 2017, uh, we really started, I started talking to our staff about the fact that um, we're looking at the fact a lot of our people are starting to retire, you know, the baby boomers, which I am one of them. Uh, they're walking out the door with a wealth of information. And if we're required to make sure that our utilities are providing for safe, reliable and affordable service, they must also be having the same problem. So we, we teamed up, we meaning the commission teamed up with our utilities and started going out having you know, whether it was working with the utilities as they were doing job fairs or going out to high schools or going out to colleges just to pass on this information about how it is important, these jobs that are out here. I remember going to a basketball camp up at John Harris High School. The funniest thing is, is you know, the kids were excited about playing basketball and then here I come, I'm going to talk to them about utilities. Well, you still either those great jobs that you know our staff made up this term of they, they hide in 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 plain uh, you know plain view you could just see them but people don't think about them they just think your lights just switch on because you turn the switch on and there's nothing behind it these jobs there's people that can come out of high school and making you know sixty seventy thousand dollars from these type of jobs, if there's apprenticeship programs that many of the utilities that will have or things of that nature. Some people may just want to go to community college. We've gone um, to so many of those different areas across the state to just talk about the different types of jobs out there. The thing that got the attention of the students that were at John Harris, Harris Harris's uh, basketball camp that summer is because they all were sitting there with their, their cell phones too. Because they looked very bored <laughs> until I said, you know, the cell phones that you guys are using, there could be some type of cyber attack and none of those things would work. And people think, oh, they'll still work. No, they weren't. That got their attention. They sat <laughs> up. I said, there's just so many different types of jobs out there. If you want to go to college, you can still get into the utility area. If you don't want to go to college, you can still get into the utility area. Attorneys work on so many different areas of utility law that you just can't even think of. I never thought of it. Only now, uh, law schools are starting to have some type of utility law classes that people can take. Before, it was just more administrative law, which covered the whole, you know, across the whole board. And of course, we need judges. We have administrative law judges within the commission. There's just so many different types of jobs. Right, right, definitely. So we we are um, uh, going to begin to wrap it up, but our theme for uh, February, uh, of course, Black History Month, um, that we do 365, 24 seven, um, we are focusing in on a theme for this particular month of then, now, and next. And it's really catered towards businesses, which is we're gonna have Brian Hudson come on you know, in our second hour and talk about businesses that, you know, local black businesses that were there, those black businesses that are, you know, here now and that we support, should support, and then those that are on the horizon, what's next? Um, so I'm gonna couch it a little bit, you know, for you. So not only with businesses, um, but overall, just the theme of then, now, and next. If I put that out there to you, what would you, what would come to mind if I said, talk to us, um, about you and your experiences here locally and professionally, uh, going off to Pittsburgh and coming back. If you had to talk to young people about the theme of then, now, and next, what would that be? What would the message be to these young people? Um, what I've been saying to young people, especially since I became a commissioner, is, is prepare yourself for the opportunities that will come your way. So in doing that, I think it covers that whole thing because when you're preparing yourself, you're not sure exactly what opportunities come your way, but there could be some opportunities that you're not prepared for because you didn't take the time to do it. Even the, the smaller jobs that you may not have wanted to do. And I, I laugh about the fact I didn't want to do the utility legislation over in the General Assembly. And here I sit as the chair of the Public Utility Commission. But all those different types of things that are preparing you or leadership roles or, or something that you can use that will bring you to the future for another job that you never expected to come your way. 
So I just say, prepare yourself for the opportunities that may come your way. Great. Uh, let's see. Jennifer Smallwood has another question. Uh, so I'll throw one more in there before we end, which is, can you discuss further the difference between the, the Philadelphia utility systems versus all the others? And why does it exist legislatively? So it's just, well, Philadelphia has a couple of different things. They do have their own water system, which we don't regulate. That's municipal owned. The Philadelphia Gas Works comes under our oversight because of legislation that were passed that was passed in 2000. And with that, they have to follow all the different requirements that we require of our utilities normally. There may be some small things that need to be tweaked because of the fact that they're not investor owned. Um, but the reason for it, the reason why it had to be done by legislation is because there's also legislation that allows for municipalities to own and be able to have oversight over their utilities. So in this case, there needed to be, make that change. And the same thing happened with the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer. The emphasis for both of them is that the elected officials in their areas felt that it would be better or best for them to be able to bring them under our jurisdiction. Uh, I, I, and I'm adding this on myself, and it's not the other commissioners, but, but generally, when there needs to be some type of rate increase for especially municipal owned entities, because they need to improve the infrastructure and everything, they usually don't like to do it because they're running for their positions. So they give it to us as the PUC and we'll, we'll do the rate for case increase and they can blame it all on us. So, so, <laughs> so I'll they just need an improvement to their infrastructure. Right. I'll just, you know, again, uh, thank you for being here. And as a reminder to our viewers, um, our, pa our podcasts, again, are designed to serve as a conduit between decision makers or those that are in positions of influence and or those who have connections with them, uh, bringing them to our communities so that we know that we have people in place that can meet, that can bring their resources and match them with the needs um, that are in our, our local communities. And I'll end with my shirt today uh, that I wore. I didn't wear a tie and instead I wore my shirt, which can't clearly states, especially when we have our young, powerful sisters, and women in general um, in decision-making positions, I always like to uh, say, uh, being a product and raised by two strong black women, um, that a woman's place is anywhere decisions are being made. So once again, Chairwoman Gladys Brown Detrell, uh, Harrisburg area, very Harrisburg area's very own, but Middletown's uh, heart. Um, she is here, she is accessible, she is a decision-maker statewide. You've heard it here on the seat at the table. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Um, stay well. We wish you well and in great health. Thanks again for joining us. We'll take thank a you. small commercial break. Um, and we'll be back at 7 o'clock with Mr. Brian Hudson, former um, president and CEO of Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, but an overall guru with regards to business development, economic development, and creating opportunities not only here in Pennsylvania, but nationwide. Um, thanks again, Chairwoman. We look forward to seeing you soon. If there's anything we can do on this side to uh, to help out from a seat at the table or the Diversity Coalition, uh, we are here for you. Um, and without any further ado, we will be back. Thanks again. Thank you.
Oh, when you hear this, my friend, please don't panic. Demons you let in run rampant after your mind. Will you stand up and challenge the evil around you? It's so natural. Listen, my friend, oh, please don't panic. Don't. Demons you let in run rampant after your mind. Will you stand up and challenge the evil around you? It's so natural. Hello, this is Juanita Edrington Grant coming to you from the Harrisburg Uptown Building, 1821 Fulton Street, the former Hamilton Health Center building. We are classified as the hub in Harrisburg, PA. You will now see a brief video of what we have named the Castile Edrington Community Room. It's on the second floor, fifth street entrance of our building at 1821 Fulton Street. We're providing this video to you so that you can get a brief glimpse of our newest addition to our building which is a room that we are allowing to be used for several different occasions uh, be it uh, educational seminars conferences family dinners um, we do have a capacity of holding at least 100 people which is 10 tables 100 chairs or a professional corporate setup and we're looking to um, place this information on the Hub website within the next couple of weeks so that you can see uh, more of the advertisement and price list and the different um, information that you may want to know about renting this space. This space was designed uh, by TLC Workbase Training and TLC Renovation, Renovation and Construction. Owner and CEO is Tari Castillo. Yes, another one of the great projects created by Tari Castillo. If you want to get in touch with us, please feel free to call me at 717-889-6377. Look forward to speaking to you from the hub. Once again, we are back. Uh, so I can't thank you all enough for staying with us. Our first hour was phenomenal, as we can see from our comment section. Um, the esteemed chairwoman Gladys Brown Detrell joined us for our first hour and was uh, full of valuable information and um, just overall discussion that I believe gives us an opportunity to understand a bit more about the Pennsylvania Utility Commission, um, opportunities that are there with regards to career pathways, and just knowing that there's somebody that we can actually touch, um, not only through this podcast, but as, as you can see in the comments section, uh, she's very well known. She's personable. She is related to all of Middletown and in through Harrisburg. And um, yeah, that, that's that's what we need. We need to see our leaders, our decision makers that are um, able, they're accessible. And we'll leave it at that. Um, our next hour uh, is going to highlight. Uh, businesses, in particular Black businesses, women-owned businesses. And our theme, again, is then, now, and next, especially here in February. And so I could think of no other person to bring on to have a realistic conversation about Harrisburg then, Harrisburg now, and the possibilities for Harrisburg next, and in particular Black businesses regarding then, now, and next. Uh, the gentleman who is going to be coming to us today for the second hour is none other than Mr. Brian Hudson, former president and CEO of Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. But more important than that, uh, Mr. Hudson is um, a homegrown professional who thought it not robbery to come back, to give back, and to be unapologetic with regards to ensuring that there was opportunities and access for people, Black people, Black businesses, uh, minorities overall in the underserved communities that were oftentimes overlooked, undervalued, and marginalized. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome a good friend of the show and a mentor of mine, uh, Mr. Brian Hudson. Again, so thank you for joining us, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank yes. you for having me. Uh, well, uh, we can get right here. into it. I mean, you're no stranger yep. to, to hard work with regards to equity and inclusion. Um, your body of work with the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency statewide, as well as a lot of the things that a lot of people may not know in regards to the housing uh, crash 
and how you were very um, instrumental in, in, in shoring up a lot of the housing markets nationwide, not only in Pennsylvania, but nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'd like to do is um, uh, touch on that a little bit, just to, just <laughs> to context, um, because a lot of times as, as Gladys, Chairwoman uh, Gladys Brown, the trail we had her on, you know, from the PUC earlier, and something that she 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 um, honed in on was making sure that the consum consumers are balanced at the table with those elected officials in the House and the Senate. And oftentimes we can look at that as such an uphill battle if we don't have contacts to be our voices at those decision making tables. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, I'll be the first to say the second to say because Jennifer Small was always going to be the first to say, you know, <laughs> you were the guy, you know, that we all needed to know. And uh, she was right. And I'm, I'm thankful. Although I was late to the party, I'm at the dance now. <laughs> I, we won't let you go. So you can talk a little bit about the, um, what you did around that housing crisis time. And then we'll well, move. yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for having me again. Uh, I think um, the crisis, what a lot of people did not realize that how devastating it was. We were like very close to a depression. So we call it the Great Recession, but we were very close to a recession because the financial markets were collapsing, uh, and you know, housing was a, a big piece of that. Uh, at, as you mentioned, I ran PHF at the time. We had exposure not because of what we were doing. Uh, I always felt that our loans was high quality, so we would do extensive underwriting, peel back the onion. If someone had a bad credit score, we would dig in. Why is the credit score bad? Uh, because they didn't pay one medical bill. Uh, so we could still make that loan. They had the cash flow to do it. No, we were in trouble because of our partners. So, and I'll tell you, you know, PHFA at that time was about five million, five billion rather, in assets. So I had relationships with a French bank called Dexia. They were backing some of our bonds. We had to get rid of them, uh, and basically sold some bonds to the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. We had relationship with German Bank. We had relationships with Wall Street firms that were basically going under. Bear Stearns, uh, as, which is now a name of the past, was a firm that is no longer around. So we had to do what I call circle the wagons, um, raise cash like any other company, uh, and then protect our assets. Uh, made numerous trips back and forth to DC. And many of you heard of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who was the biggest uh, buyers of mortgages. Well, we have relationships with them too. So I ran a tape of a half billion dollars of mortgages showed it to Fannie, said, I want to sell you these loans. And they said, boy, these are great loans. I said, well, these are the loans you should have been buying instead of that stuff from Countrywide that you were buying. So we sold some loans to Fannie and protected ourselves. But more importantly, I think what the crisis showed to me is an opportunity and allowing us to get into what we call the taxable mortgage market, I meaning PHFA to get into that market. It also showed what was needed in terms of education. So we started our housing counseling network. There were some pockets in Pennsylvania where home buyers were clearly taking advantage of. And it started up in the Poconos area. Uh, people from New York uh, area being enticed to buy their dream home in the Poconos. What they didn't tell them was that the builder and uh, the appraisers colluded. They didn't tell them about appraisals, escrows. So these people are going there and buying these homes and within months we're going into foreclosure. I spent six months, nine months, a year up in the Poconos going back and forth. And most of them were minorities. I would say 90% were minorities in this group, uh, explaining to them about what was happening. I said, you know what? We need an education program. Now, what you see today is, is housing counseling is a part of that entire home buying process. Uh, if you have a low credit score, a credit score below 700, and that's not really low, but I think it should be mandatory for everyone so that you understand what you're signing, what your responsibilities are. I tell you, there were people in the room with PhDs and doctor's degree who did not know what the documents were they were signed to buy a home. Yeah. Fast forward now, uh, we have a different crisis, pandemic on our hands. Uh, the mortgage market slowed down, there's an issue of supply. But back then, uh, we were so close, as I mentioned, to a depression. I viewed housing as a, a catalyst to help jumpstart the economy, which is what's needed right now. So. I think the Biden administration hopefully is looking at that too. And that's what we're lobbying for. A lot of resources to go into home, CDBG, uh, homeless initiatives, counseling, you name it. 
Uh, that's what needs to happen right now. And that's what was occurring uh, after the recession. We had a housing credit. We negotiated with U.S. Treasury and the Obama administration to push billions of dollars of resources into all of the housing markets across the country to help jumpstart the, uh, the economy. And I think that's what we're looking to do again for a different reason, because we've got a pandemic that slowed the economy. Back then it was, you know, I call it unscrupulous trading of mortgage-backed securities, which occurred. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, we, we weathered the storm, but there was some crazy time. Was it stressful? Absolutely. I've never been through anything more stressful, quite truthfully, when you talk about teetering that close to a depression. Uh, like some of those has uh, lived through in the 1930s. But that's how close we were to a complete collapse of the financial markets. We survived, but we're not without some pain and, and some changes. Dodd-Frank got strengthened probably a little too much. You, whenever you have something that happened like that, you go they go too tight on the uh, restrictions. So then people got to have 20% down. Well, nobody has that kind of money, very little to come in and buy a home. So now we're we're back to some normal levels, but still we need a, a jump start for this economy to get things going too. But uh, those were definitely trying times and we were at the heat of it. But I tell you what, I was enjoying it because every every uh, crisis has a silver opportunity and our silver lining was to get into these taxable markets so that we at PHFA could do direct mortgages for the people that we were trying to serve. And that, that worked very well for us. Great, that's leadership, um, definitely leadership at its core. And the reason why I wanted to touch on that in the housing market is because a lot of times businesses, um, in particularly black businesses, um, they are asked, you know, to to bring some collateral to the table. And a lot of times it's the house, you know, that is used, or they'll they'll take a loan um, in terms of the equity in their homes to the business, and so forth and so on. So I wanted to make that. Um, that, that transition from the importance of housing and economic development from that standpoint, in terms of stabilization near, uh, in terms of financial stabilization, um, and then how that can give you a trajectory towards business ownership, home ownership, and I believe business ownership, is, there's a direct correlation. And that then, from my perspective, leads into healthier, safer, more prosperous communities as a whole. Um, yeah. And so if you can talk about those those um those entities you know coming together and what right. you've seen your experiences well you know i'm i'm a you know, we were in the rental business and we were in the home ownership business and i'll be the first to tell you that home ownership is not for everyone so we were dealing with different groups uh some folks who maybe owned a home already and went into rental we had apartments that we lent money to developers to do just that uh, and then there was a guy who asked me at one of my uh, press conferences, like, well, what if I can't afford a home right now? I said, well, then stay a renter and go through our counseling network to be prepared for home ownership. Uh, get your debts in order because those underwriting criteria is not going away. We want to help you get ready so that you understand what those liabilities are. After what I went through in the Poconos, I didn't want an unprepared homeowner coming to the table. Uh, at the same time, there are some folks who wanted to be homeowners. Now, uh, for those, we had products that were structured to help them get there. Owning a home is always uh, wealth building. And I think anyone who's been there and done that or looking to get there, understand that you build up equity. You know, yes, the tax law changed so you don't get uh, maybe as much as the uh, itemized reduction on your tax return, but it's still, it's a wealth building and it does build community. So when we go into a community, we were looking for a combination of rental and home ownership. You mentioned, Carl, about uh, business people borrowing, uh, tapping equity in their home to start a business. Unfortunately, that happened, you know, too many times for minority uh, business. I did it myself. And people know I used to run a nightclub at 6th and McClay Street. I mortgaged my home. I even mortgaged my car because it was paid for. So I put <laughs> another mortgage on the car. That's my collateral for the loan to get the liquor license and buy the equipment for the club. It paid out, but most Others don't have to go that route. So, yeah, we, right. we struggle to go through that. And that's why I wanted to have homeowners become a wealth building, a community building part of all the communities around here, starting with this is hometown. This is Harrisburg. So let's start in your own backyard and you can go from there and access the capital, because that's that's really what's needed for the business aspect. And, you know, if you go back to like the 60s, 70s, 
Uptown Harrisburg was was booming. You had black businesses that all up and down Sixth Street, Martha's Turntables, Carter's Store. Uh, there was the Fish House. Uh, Miss Fanny just passed away about a few months ago, as a matter of fact. And we all know about the Fish House. Uh, and yeah, we had our share of of, um, of what we call warding hose, all the bars, Carousel, Lounge, Lucky Seven, Sevens. But those were all legitimate businesses. Uh, and that was a booming strip uptown. Uh, yeah. And you had the neighborhood schools, you know, which was the other foundation. Uh, Hamilton School, which is where I used to attend, so they had busing. And I was one block from Hamilton School. They sent me to Downey. I had to catch a bus to go to Downey. <laughs> <laughs> so good schools, don't get me wrong, but it didn't make sense to bus me all the way over to Downey. And I could have walked to school at, uh, at Hamilton. But those uh we had our business the hudson barber and beauty school uh the first um black owned uh, barber and beauty school on the east coast for some time and barber beauty supply place right here uh in harrisburg uh i learned to buy supplies and never learned to cut hair but <laughs> buy supplies and i sold donnie's red kin all the products right out of our storefront up there which was was good you had the whiz uh, which was the black owned uh, max uh, black owned radio station I used to advertise on the Wiz, talking about supporting black businesses. I said he's starting. It was it was a uh, cable FM, unusual st structure, but that was his. That was the only way he can get into that market uh, as a as a black man. He just didn't have the access to own his own station in a different form. But I said, you know what? I'm going to advertise on the Wiz because that's who we were listening to. So I hey, I remember. Over. <laughs> you remember the I, 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 oh yeah, I remember being in the Marcus Garvey program before and after school program right. the second floor of, of the Y. Right. I remember we all ran to the window because Rick James was coming in. Right. Right. That's Came right. Rick That's right. James right there on Sixth Street. So That's right. And uh, I, I booked uh, I had Millie Jackson come in. I had the shy lights at my place. I was getting ready to book the Heinze brothers. Uh but it was entertainment as they were passing through uh going from DC or to New York. It was easy to stop here in Harrisburg and you catch those uh, tenant, uh, or entertainers like that. But yeah, you were in Marcus Garvey, so the Y was right there. That's where I grew up and exercised that all the time. And I used to love Martha's Turntable because with Martha's Turntable, you I could never remember what the name of the record was, but I go in there and hum the tune. It goes like, hmm, she's like, that's not it. I know you talk about. And she put the record on. <laughs> and I said, that's it. Yeah, that's the one I want. She said, I know. <laughs> And she, so we, yeah. and she give you a record. I, you know, I miss those days because it was a community, and that's yeah. what we try to to bring back uh, to to have it as community. You know, even the Hamilton Grill, Six and Hamilton Street, home of the cheeseburger sub and the, the hot <laughs> sausages and all. Uh, Leffrey Store, which was at yes. Six and Calcutt Street, uh, uh -huh. and then Leffrey Funeral Home, which was further up on Sixth Street, closer to Schuylkill. So yeah. those were thriving businesses that went away. You know, uh, either for one reason or another, capital, access, business, opportunity, you name it. And you, to rebuild that, it takes access to capital, education, and basically bringing folks along so that, yeah, you, you can do this. It's not to say it's going to be easy, but you, you find a niche and try to rebuild these communities. At one point, the plaza at 6th and McClay Street, Edmont Plaza, we had finance that has kind of a innovation. It was Trevor Edwards and Earl Harris and Russ Montgomery, basically. They were the oh. team. That's why it was called Edmont Plaza for a strip plaza. Uh, even back then, the uptown uh, shopping plaza was booming. Every storefront was full, if you recall those days. That's got to be redone now. So there's a lot of opportunity that uh, can happen here. Uh, we just got to get on the same page and, and make it happen. The barbershops, uh, they used to Jimmy Cheatham, Jimmy Chief still cutting here. Uh, Scotty's was on Fifth Street, Lower Fifth Street. Uh, so those those yeah. th those businesses can be come back, uh, and that's why you know that capital is important to have that done. Uh, but when you talk about building communities, it is a combination of rental for those who would like to rent and home ownership. Those pieces have got to be available, and we invested in. Uh, the townhomes around the market to provide home ownership. We invested in Governor's Place uh, down at uh, Sixth and McClay Street and uh, Fifth and McClay, where the new homes were. PHF put a lot of money into those areas, and you have the new developers like uh, Tark uh, Tark Castile uh, TLC, 
the veterans housing now where the old uh, Amblin Health Center was and the hub. So that's for me, that's just the beginning, you know, uh, to make this happen and, and turn these communities around. But now we can talk about this all day long, quite truly. So, well, I mean, that's stuff. where, you know, that's where we are now with re in regards to how do we truly build, right. you know, other communities. And while at the same time, um, protecting against gentrification, um, you know, safeguards against that, against that. And, you know, just beyond gentrification in terms of color. But in terms of elitist attitudes, thinking, and you know that 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 the, the people who are coming into communities uh, with the money, but not with the commitment, right? Uh, and so that balance, and of course, that they, then again brings in those decision makers in city government and state government, and you know uh, around there. So, would you you obviously balance that as well with regards to you know PHFA, and I won't, I don't want to keep on on PHFA because. Yeah. You're in a position now where you have left a legacy. You have um, built a legacy there, but the the thing that has always, you know, attracted most people to you is that you never forget. You never forgot from which you came, and you continue to be unapologetic with regards to making sure that Harrisburg had a seat at the table. That Harrisburg was always mentioned, whether you were in Erie or Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, or Lehigh Valley, right. you know personally attested that because I'm in some of those places with you. Um, but talk about the importance of being in a decision-making position and still being committed and unapologetic towards service for those that are out here that are in our community, in communities that are oftentimes overlooked and underserved. Yeah. And, and I think uh, when you're in a position as a decision-maker, I think it's uh, it's an obligation in, does it sometimes get forgotten? Sure. Or does it sometimes get um, not pushed because you don't want to make a certain decision because someone's going to criticize you? Yeah, but you can't let that stop you from uh, doing the right thing, which is to build the communities. My my feeling was that, you know, Harrisburg, number one, is capital city. Uh, the capital city should reflect its status within the state, meaning that it should have these type of communities. It should have these opportunities for its residents. So. I've always felt that way, and I tried to make that happen. Uh, yes, I ran an organization that was in the affordable housing and mission driven, but I actually wanted to take it further uh, all the way through who are we uh, lending our resources to, and are they going to provide affordable uh, housing to these communities, uh, certainly for Harrisburg and then uh, across uh, the state, and then telling my colleagues across the country that this is what you should be doing. If you get everyone on the same page to think that way. And I mean, you know, uh, uh, county, city, government, you know, affordable housing has to be uh, a, uh, a permanent criteria that needs to happen. There's a lot of new housing happening. Uh, some of that should be a percentage of affordable uh, to avoid gentrification because that's gonna happen. It's gonna begin to happen now. We got the courthouse going up. Property values are starting to soar in certain areas around the courthouse because the investors are coming in seeing that as an opportunity. And quite truthfully, I don't view some of them as being long-term investors. Those are opportunists that are coming in to do that. So uh, we've got to be on the same page. It has to be uh, set aside, affordability. You know, apartment units, whether that's 10, uh, tw I'd love to see 20%, but I don't think anything right. should be less than 10%. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think anything should be less than 10, quite truthfully. I'd like to see 20, quite as part of that back uh back in the um 80s and, and uh 70s and 80s we we should do apartment complexes we call them 80 20s 20 percent of the units had to be affordable for taxes and bonds so you're getting our resources that's right. what we want to see you know right uh so that criteria can go with any entity coming in to get resources from you know city state whatever the case may be but that's got to be when you talk about decision making they got to make those decisions to get that done and that goes back. Jennifer has a great question. and I'm going to highlight that. And it goes right along the line. I was in one of these. I'm, these, these young people were inviting me to these these up and coming groups. And it's called Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. So I'm going talking with some some young uh, people that were very much interested in um, uh, development. And, okay. you know, the bridge and Winton Williams and Michael uh, Simpson. And one of the things that came up was how in the hell 
did all this RCAP money go through, you know, the yeah. city basically, and it didn't stop at the, you know, at the bridge, for example. Yeah. And my direct response, you know, was that's why we need to make sure Patty Kim and DeSantos is working hard for us. Um, it stops there. Um, in, in my opinion, you can elaborate. Um, I, I often, you know, you navigate it both sides of the aisles, you know, in state house. And we, we know that it goes back to um, having access to decision makers and having there's no way they they should have ignored uh, the bridge program. Number one is the eyesore in the community. Bishop McDevitt has been abandoned. Um, they picked up and left and has been abandoned since. And um, there's opportunities for our, our, our leaders on a state level to be helpful. And they were not. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I know sometimes, yeah, you're right. Because what when projects would apply to us, uh, they've lobbied, you know, the uh, council people, the township supervisor, uh, the commissioners, the state, uh, the state reps and the state senators. So we get a ton of stack letters of support there, you know, and all the funders are looking to see, you know, who came in, who committed, <laughs> you know, what's your capital stack look like, let's say, uh, of these applications, who's in. A lot of times, you know, they say they applied for funding for much for tax credits. You know, we got a we got a cycle around. But, you know, when a project has what we call impact, you know, that catches my eye quite truthfully. And right. those are what you're describing are impact projects. I don't know how the messages gets delivered, but if I was delivering those messages, it'd be to, you know, Patty and, and, and Senator DeSanto saying, this is an impact project in your district. This is why this needs to happen. It's transformative. Uh, we got X, Y, Z. These pieces are in place. Uh, that's what needs to occur. And and maybe it did. I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, what occurred there, but those projects have to get funded. The ones that get funded like that, that's the push on them. Everyone's on board, same page. When you talk about having competing projects, for instance, you know, if they're if the pot's limited, you know, what projects get funded? Well, you know, to me, those that have the much the most impact. For community, you know, you so you start to stack them. You know, we see them in other communities. We need a, we need a lot here in Harrisburg. So, all right, we're not going to get you know uh, as much as we like, but we should we should have had multiple impact projects right here in the city from that stack. From yeah. my standpoint, when I'm awarding credits, that's what I was looking at. I said, wait a minute, you know, I got three applications uh, from the Harrisburg. Uh, I'm going to try to do all three of them. You know, <laughs> folks not might like them, but that's what I'm going to try to get to, you know, but for this, based on how much I got to give out across the state, but I, I guarantee I'm going to get at least a two of those projects if I can't get all three of them. But that's what's got to occur. That mindset's got to change. Like, this is the city. This is the capital city. Right. And this is a city that I don't think it's got to share the resources for many, many years, you know. The courthouse going in. Oh, that's great, man. I, I I like to see the courthouse there, but we can't live in the courthouse. You know, right? We can't live in the courthouse. The courthouse provides opportunities for investors to come in and gobble up some of this land, basically. Right. You right. know, I want to see a project that builds a business that provides uh, affordable housing, and I would like to see a combination of home ownership and rental and right. business building. That's what I'd like to see before. I mean this land is taken out. I'm sorry, Carl, but you know, no, 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 no. I'm getting on my soapbox, man. Because this is no, because I'm, I'm, hey, I'm with you, and, <laughs> and you're saying it much more eloquently than I would be saying it. Yeah, yeah. That's you know. why I'm being. That's why I have the mute button right now. Right. But, <laughs> to, to your point, I mean, the mute button for myself. Right. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> the, uh, the the point that you talked that you touched on earlier, and Jennifer's touched on about yeah. Sixth Street, in essence, being our Black Wall Street, and now we have, yeah. you know, and I'll just name names, uh, Mascaro out of Pittsburgh, they came in to do the courthouse after, in essence, you know, ignoring the local black businesses, you know, trying to get on that project and then was turned around and awarded the contract for the archives building down the street. We're the right. only legion. Same thing. All the same. Same, mm -hmm. same thing. And yeah. so, you know, we, we talked to Kerry Kirkland, who's deputy secretary over at Department of General Services. We talked to Secretary Topper. You know, it, went on, it fell on deaf ears. Then they, there's another project going on, of course, you know, up on 7th Street, another state building, the ODH uh, building. Yes. So 
there's when 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 um those that are on the outside looking in to Harrisburg and have so much to say um want to be critical there needs to be a a, a a delicate balance of understanding that there's things that are to this day being done on purpose by um closing off access to afford a, to career pathways we'll say right. uh, you have three major projects right. you know, in one section of the city and over 90%, 95% of the workforce on those three projects are Caucasian males. And I would say roughly 80%, 70, 72 to 80% are not from the Harrisburg city, not mm -hmm. from the city. Right. You know, and so when we go back again and you know the patriot news and pen live and other places um are giving their spin on what's going on in our city they just so happen to conveniently overlook the fact that those opportunities that were supposed to be you know for everyone just so happen to bypass those that are local uh, located here and in most need is those of those opportunities yeah. and so that is you know where i keep going back to saying that's where we need to have more uh, engagement with the state. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and it comes down to for them business as usual. They they were used to going in communities like that, you know, and and, and doing it that way. You know, I think the, the pushback has got to come. As you re remember, we reached out to Senators Toomey and Senators Casey, and when they started digging into the uh, legislation around that they were a little bit surprised themselves that it didn't have a lot of teeth in it. So, right. uh, and I was shocked when they came back with that answer because we said, we, we didn't realize it didn't have, we're going to have to strengthen that. Well, you know what, right. the time, the time to do that was back then. Yes. So and that's got to happen all the way through so that business as usual doesn't occur. You know, we got qualified uh, contractors who can do the exact same work and get this job done from the community. And right. that's the that's that's what I wanted to show when I said to, you know, our group, you know, we're going to award these tax credits to three minority developers. And that was TLC. Uh, that was Donnie Crenshaw up in Erie and Derek Tillman uh, in Pittsburgh. You know, first time we are getting three allocations of, uh, of tax credits uh, to minority developers in one round, basically. So to me, that should occur every round. But. That's that's yeah. the push that we were going to make, um, and that that's that's one of those that's a um, what I would say is low hanging fruit um, yeah. because yeah. that takes advocacy that takes you yeah. know beyond just a handshake and a picture with our elected officials, whether that's at the mayoral level, city council, state rep, county commissioners, right, you know, state senate. You know, it takes us as a community, yeah. in particular, a black agenda, a black community, which is why we're we're we've created this space. You know, we are unapologetically black and proud of it. Um, here on this, on this podcast and in, in music man, multimedia studios, uh, shout out to the Lewis brothers and Chad at the district. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we are, we are filling the void here and we, we're having realistic conversations uh, so that we won't continue to have to say they should have done this, or we could have done that, or we continue to be overlooked and marginalized, you know? So, um, are there, you know, with that theme of then, now, and next, what do you see next in terms of the possibilities for um, not not home ownership, but business growth and development? And what would be some advice that you give some of these um, these startups um, um, or, or, you know, right. the TLCs and, you know, the, the Elise um, Irvis that are right. out here and the me and right. Urban Knob and things. So what do you, what some advice you give those? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think one thing I want to say is that, you know, with um, diversity getting its uh, uh, a serious look now, there's an opportunity. And, you know, those opportunities can be fleeting. So take full advantage of it. Those of you that have businesses, uh, do your homework. Make sure you're familiar with resources that may be available to your business. And sometimes it's right in front of you, but you may not know that. Uh Get into the networking. And I said this on a previous podcast. We all have to stay connected, but you have to stay connected to the business community. And that's not uh, just a tight group that you're dealing with. But 
Uh, in order to move forward, you have to broaden your network. Uh, what are you? What are you looking for? Where are you looking to grow strategically? If you're going to start a business, get educated about what that business uh, looks like and what it should look like, because there's a lot of resources out there. So education is a big piece of that. Uh, and then the next piece around that is networking. And then we talked about lobbying. You know, when you lobby, you know, find out who knows who and who can work with who and uh, for these resources, because uh, we are going to have another stimulus package. Uh, more to come. The economy is going to pick up. There are going to be some opportunities to start new businesses and for other businesses to get an infusion of capital that's much needed. Uh, and for me, uh, I think education is a big proponent of that. Uh, and your business might be struggling now, but uh, get into that networking. And that means uh, joining the diversity group uh, coalition, becoming a member, networking with those who are in uh, businesses uh, that complement yours, for instance. And right. there's a way to do that. Uh, and then uh, make some new relationships uh, to expand your business because that's the best advice I can I can give you because that's how technically that's really how it's done for the decision makers. You know, I think the decision makers have to take a focused look at what they can change. This is what I always looked at is, all right, is this a federal guideline or is this a PHFA guideline? If it's PHFA, then I'm going to look at how can we change it to make it work better for what we want to do, who we want to serve. Uh, those are always the questions I ask. Uh, if we got to abide by the feds, or is it something that we created for ourselves? Um, as a CEO, I wanted to have jobs. So, for instance, um, people talk about a percent, you know, of uh, employees. PHFA had a when I left uh, my mission. Uh, there, where I was there to have as many minorities as I could in positions. And you heard the story. We can't fly qualified contract. We can't qualify. <laughs> keep looking. Keep looking. Find me. Uh, there's people to be found for the job. Uh, I'm happy to say that we were 31% minority uh, employees uh, for at PHFA. We had 330 employees, 31%. Uh, you hear the governor talk about uh, moving the uh, uh, minimum wage to 15. Well, guess what? I moved our minimum wage to 15 two years ago. Mm -hmm. Two, three. Now three years ago, I've been retired a year. So now it's about three and a half, four years. Are you really retired? Uh, I'm semi-retired. <laughs> so, we ain't gonna let that happen. Yeah, but what got me, what struck me, was that I'm looking at our our salary complement, and I said, "How in the world can anybody make it at this salary? What's that translate into?" As a first of all, I don't want anyone uh, starting here less than fifteen dollars an hour. And we paid our summer help. That means those coming in from college. We would right. bring in about 15 to 20 interns every year. They got $15 an hour also. So for the decision makers, that's a decision you can make. So uh, that's what needs to happen though, Carl, from on both fronts. So yeah. um, that's just my thoughts. And I, I know others would probably say the same. And don't get me wrong, what's happening here in Harrisburg is not unique just to Harrisburg. I've seen it in Philadelphia and Philadelphia still grabbing grappling with gentrification because they got so many big communities there. We got Harrisburg here. We got to be able to control this. It's not as big as some of these areas. There's no excuse why we cannot do this as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It can happen. I think, you know, one, one of the things that, you know, team and I, we, we talk about a lot is, you know, we have a lot of younger people, young, talented uh, black professionals, you know, come into this area. And we, we're trying to use this platform and the reason they're going to see um, you and, and others revolve on this part on this podcast, because they have to catch, you know, they need that historical balance. They need to know right. that um, the, the, the Patriot News does not um, is not indicative of everything that Harrisburg has to offer. Um, so one of the things that we want to ensure, you know, from you know, Music Man Multimedia uh, Studios is that we are bringing people on to this podcast that are accessible um, to those young people who have a sincere desire to serve the Harrisburg community. Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking not robbery to serve the masses and not just go alone to get along in terms of the chosen few. And so, you know, we're going to take a quick commercial break. I ask you just to stay with us for um, a moment here. And then when we come okay. back, We'll have some, um, some, have some closing remarks, maybe a couple more questions, some closing remarks. Okay. And we can't thank you enough for agreeing to uh, be here with us again. Sure, sure, absolutely. 
Thank you. Hey there, my name is Winnie O, and I am here at Music Man Multimedia Studios, and I am representing the Harassment and Assault Reporting Platform today. That's HARP. You can catch us at www.harpnow.org. Please be sure to check out Music Man Studios. Bam. Follow, like, share, all that good stuff on all their social media and on the website. Hi, fam. Hi. Okay. Thank you all. Again, we are here with former president and CEO, now recently retired, uh, Mr. Brian Hudson, Harrisburg, born and raised. Um, I guess what, what we'd like to to kind of wind up, wind down with is, um, you know, well, let me just open it up. Is there something that you would like to say or had to have people know um, with regards to Harrisburg impact projects or uh, just anything overall, you know, in general? Well, I, I think I get a lot of calls and questions about tax credits and how they work and, and resources. And I mentioned about business owners doing uh, their homework regards to available resources, but I did want to, you know, throw some out there. For instance, uh, the Logan Mountain Tax Credit is, is like the single largest source of equity coming to the table. And I'll be honest with you, yes, it, it's complicated, but if you're going to do a uh, multifamily housing above 24 units, it's the piece you got to go get. So um, in terms of doing your research, there's some great documents out there. Cone Resnick uh, has a, a good training course. If you Google Logan Mountain Tax Credit, uh, there's HUD information that will come up because HUD's a partner there, but they don't uh, administer the credit. PHFA does, uh, but they're used with a lot of HUD properties also. Um, and I would say start to take a look at that if that's the, uh, the avenue that you want to go down as you pursue some of your dreams. There's also um, soft money. Soft money I call you know the grant money. That's the, that's the, that's the good money you go after because uh, you don't have to pay that back. So, uh, <laughs> PHFA has something which is called FAIR. Pennsylvania Housing and Affordability Re really Rehabilitation and Enhancement. Uh, I didn't come up with a name, but it's there, P-H-A-R-E. Uh, and those are grants that can uh, be up to half a million dollars in some cases. Um, DCD has <laughs> some funds there. So get familiar with Department of Community Economic Development. And I'm rattling these off because these are all of the resources as you look at. Some might fit for you, some may not. Uh, but start doing your research around this. If you have a business, if you're starting a business, because all of these are coming to play at some point or some time or another. The county has the gaming money uh, and then the, uh, also the uh, county trust, 1% uh, uh, housing trust money. So uh, look at these source resources as uh, put your application together. And many times when these applications are occurring, it's a dream and a thought. Uh, if you need to get help with writing that, then do that. You know, don't try to go it alone. You know, you tap into that network that I mentioned earlier of someone who may know about that to help pull together your narrative. I tell you, a lot of these fundings are done because it's a very good a narrative, and the decision maker gets the point that this could be an impactful project right off the bat. Uh, there's a lot to be done here. Uh, I think the opportunity is good. We've got to go get it uh, and not sit on the sidelines this time around yeah. uh, and make sure we get that. Uh, and I think push the decision makers to do that carve out, quite truthfully. You know, those who are in the power or the position to make decisions about how the pie gets split up, you know, they should be held accountable too. you know. Uh, hey, I've been questioned. Uh, my feet been put to the fire. Why did you fund XYZ project? You know, that didn't even rank well. Because it has an impact and it needed to be done. And I can defend that. Uh, they can defend it too. So you got to hold their feet to the fire because the decision makers are going to be the ones who open some of these doors for it. You, you, you can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We got to be united in making this push. But I tell you what, uh, the timing is right. And I feel good about where things are because it's a, it's a national issue that's happening right now. And we got to get our resources. And I'll tell you that I'm working with some members of Congress now to triple and double some of the federal resources that are coming to the table. You say that you see that Congress is fighting over how much uh, President Biden is asking for almost two trillion. Well, um, that's what needs to be done. My frustration during the Great Recession was that it wasn't enough. It wasn't fast enough. Uh, and here we are again. So I'm glad to see that his numbers big. Uh, we got to go big. 
because that's what's going to take to jumpstart uh, the economy. And we got to make sure that we get our share of that pie. So, yep, there you go. No, nope. that's my words of uh, of of uh, exit. I'll say, Carl. No, uh, <laughs> well, you never exited. You know, as my as my grandmother says, all closed eyes ain't sleep, and all goodbyes ain't gone. So, <laughs> you know, you you will be back, and we will be you know talking with you. But again, you know, let me say to our audience, this is a man who we can touch, who's talking about how they are lobbying and and, and fighting and engaging Congress. Congress. You know, it's not just CNN, MSNBC, Fox News. These are people that are coming on our podcast, meaning our, meaning the city of Harrisburg's podcast. And we are having conversations about engaging Congress. Not when someone is professed to be from Harrisburg, when they are involved in an attempted coup on January 6th, but the people that are really decision makers on the right side of engaging Congress. We have them here at our 100% owned and controlled uh, multimedia center uh, hosted by the Music Man. I'm, I'm owned by Music Man. And so, again, I would just like to say, you know, thank you, uh, Brian, a Absolutely. mentor, a dear friend, and more importantly, someone who thinks it not, does not think it robbery to give back to the underserved and underrepresented. So uh, we'll be back after this commercial. And um, again, thank you, Mr. Hudson, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so again, we are back. Can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, if you have any particular questions after the podcast ends, you know where to find us. Uh, podcast A Seat at the Table, uh, hosted by yours truly. Uh, again, I cannot thank Chad, Scott, Conrad Lewis, Craig Lewis enough uh, for providing an opportunity for us to be involved as a community, to lead something that is you know, uh, for us, by us. And that is no plagiarism. That is just um, acknowledging the fact that we have young, talented uh, uh, men and women in our grasp that we need to make sure we take full advantage of. Um, the comment section has been booming. Um, we are thankful for that. Uh, what you don't know is that we are all in we, the three of us, the four, the five of us today, we're in five different locations. Um, heavy, heavy, heavy shout out to uh, Craig, to, I'm sorry, to Conrad Lewis and to Chad Scott. These brothers are brilliant behind the scenes, um, remotely uh, bringing this podcast to you so that we were um, safe in our own homes. Um, it is just you know a beautiful thing to be involved with this podcast to bring decision makers to you to have your voices heard in a way that is you know unfiltered um straightforward and just overall genuine so you know i have the distinct pleasure and honor of being in front of the camera and and receiving a lot of credit but the behind the scenes work i cannot um express enough gratitude for the amount of behind the scenes work that brother Craig, brother Conrad, and brother Chad puts in. Um, as of right now, I don't know if their walkways are shoveled or not. Mine is not. Um, but beyond all of that, we are um, in a position of power, in a position where whether it's individuals running for political office, or individuals that just wanted to, you know, um, gain, you know, in, 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 to become influencers. You know, we have the ability now, um, thanks to these brothers, to come onto a platform and truly, I mean, truly tell 
uh, our unadulterated stories with regards to, you know, the truth from our eyes, from our perspective. And that has not been done. Um, it just has not been done um, uh, in, in, in the last 20. We'll just be kind and say that has not been done in the last 25 to 30 years, you know, with fidelity, uh, with integrity and with character. And so, you know, again, it's not a seat at the table that I'm trying to big up. It is Music Man Multimedia Studios, 100% Black owned and controlled, and is open and welcome to anyone with a vision to unify for the right reasons, you know, under one umbrella to make sure that our community is well represented, well represented, well served, and at the forefront of decision making and not an afterthought. And so with that, I'll be signing off. Um, we will be moving into um, doing podcasts Mondays and Thursdays from six to eight. Um, we have a dynamic show uh, next Thursday. All the shows are dynamic. Let me go back. All of them are going to be dynamic by the producers and executive producers um, because of the producers and executive producers. But next Thursday, February the 11th, we're going to have at least four black doctors. One um, is a classmate of mine, Dr. Julianne Adams Burke, um, who is OBGYN. She is now down in Georgia. I believe it's Connors, uh, Con Conyers, Georgia. Um, it's class of 1991 graduate. Um, trying to get another one of our classmates who is also um, a doctor, second generation doctor. I won't call his name right now until I confirm that he could join us, but also class of 1991. Notice class 1991, at least two medical doctors, um, as well as three doctors from Penn State Harris. I'm sorry, from Penn State Hershey, and one doctor from Penn State Her Her Penn State um, Hershey. But he is the trauma director at Holy Spirit Hospital. So, um, looking forward to having this discussion next Thursday, February 11th, with a team of black brilliant doctors which will discuss um the virus COVID-19 virus and the vaccine vaccination um which is a hot topic so i'm sure as we enter into our second week of black history month um for february um that will be a topic well worth its salt in terms of discussion so again we like to just thank you and we leave you with um, our gratitude, our thanks, and um, continue, continue blessings for health and safety. With that, thanks for signing on. And we'll look forward to seeing you again Thursday, 6 to 8. Stay well and healthy.